different, the 13 dining halls at Harvard, and would ask every student as they walked by our table, will you bicycle across America with us next summer to fight hunger? And uh, 38 people agreed to go with us, so we spent the year organizing. We were organizing the five committees, designed the route, uh, found places to stay, sponsorship, media, training, all that. Um, and uh, in the summer of, uh, of 1983, we took a six-hour flight to Seattle, and then we spent nine and a half weeks pedaling 4,200 miles across the continental United States and during a very, very hot summer. And uh, we raised about $80,000 for Oxfam. But more than that, what was so powerful about the experience was this feeling that we had when we rode into Boston of being completely depleted, that there was nothing left to give. You know, we had capitalized on the full measure of our potential. And that, that was really a feeling that I wanted. You know, I didn't feel, I didn't want to leave college feeling like there was something still in me to do. So I moved to Los Angeles uh, about a year or two after that, and and then in the early 90s I began to lose many of my friends to AIDS, and those were the days before protease inhibitors had been developed. You know, there was just AZT was the only drug out there really, and so a friend of yours would come to you and say, "I just found out I'm HIV positive," and six weeks later you'd be gone. You know. Um, and this happened over and over and over again. Um, you would be going to memorial services and meeting these kids' parents at, at their memorial service for the first time. And you had tremendous grief and you wanted to do something big about it, but again, there was nothing big the average person could do. You know, you could buy a red ribbon or you could go to like a black tie charity dinner. But you know, when you just buried a bunch of your friends, those things don't somehow measure up to what you really have inside of you. And so I, knowing the power of that cross-country ride, I thought, well, what if we, the AIDS epidemic needs something big like that? So we created a seven-day bike ride called California AIDS Ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles, 600 miles. You had to go the whole seven days, you had to go the whole 600 miles, um, you'd sleep in a tent with a stranger in this big encampment that we created. And what was different about it is we set a minimum pledge requirement. You had to raise $2,000 in order to go. And that was pretty radical and it was pretty new. Up until then, charitable event policy had been to welcome people no matter what they raised. It was almost an ethic. Um, but it wasn't a revenue model. And so we knew that in order to raise serious money, there, there had to be some threshold that people had to get beyond. So it worked. That first event was very successful. We had uh, 478 riders, and we netted a million dollars for the uh, LA Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center, which was a huge amount of money for them at the time. And then we began to expand the AIDS rides around the country, and we did them from Boston to New York, and we had 3,500 riders, and they netted $4 million, and we did them from the Twin Cities to Chicago, and across Texas, and uh, down through Florida. And then we established a series of events called the Vaccine Rides, that were specifically for vaccine research, and we did those across Alaska, and across the Continental Divide in Montana, and across the Canadian border. And in the midst of all of that, we looked at the issue of breast cancer, where there was a similar dynamic, where people were losing their mothers and their sisters and their, their wives, but there was no, nothing big you could do to express your desire to make a difference there. So we asked simply, we looked at the walkathon model and asked, why are walkathons always five or ten kilometers long? Who made up that rule? Let's make a really long walkathon. So we created this 60-mile walk from Santa Barbara to Malibu called the Breast Cancer Three Day. And the same as the AIDS rides, you had to walk the whole 60 miles, you had to go the whole three days, sleep in a tent, you had to raise $1,200. And that too was successful, so we began to expand 
those around the country. Um, nine years uh, after we started, uh, 182,000 people had participated in one of these events. They raised $565 million. Um, we netted $305 million after all expenses and unrestricted funds for a variety of causes. And uh, we were the subject in 02 of a Harvard Business School case study, which was sweet because Harvard Business School had rejected me for admission. So that was really fun to go back there and, and teach them a little something. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get into this. We can talk about it in Q&A or afterwards if you want. But, but um, for no earth-shattering reason, I just established this endeavor as a for-profit company. I had had a for-profit fundraising consulting company, which was not at all uncommon. So we just organized these events under that umbrella. And we simply charged a fixed fee for every event that we did, never a percentage. 100% of the money went to the charity, and they just paid us our fee, which in a hindsight calculation was about, I think, 3.5% of the amount we raised. But the fact that we were for-profit gave um, the media a good hook for a narrative that we were a controversial company. And the more, um, the larger we grew, the more that narrative took hold. Uh, this uh, is one of five sections of the mobile city that we would build every night. So there were these tent neighborhoods on a grid, and everybody had a tent to dress. And you know, there were mobile kitchens and mobile showers, hundreds of chemical toilets, dining tents, mobile stages for <clears throat> nightly entertainment, mobile medical units. And this thing had to be uh, taken down every morning, packed up, and moved to the destination the riders or the walkers were headed to and set back up before they arrived. Beyond the logistics and beyond the fundraising, there was an emotional component to these events that to me was the most powerful <coughs> aspect of them. People moving beyond their limits, doing things that they considered impossible. We did not market these events to athletes or cyclists. We marketed these events to average people, full page ads in the New York Times or the LA Times, to average people who lost someone to suicide or to uh, breast cancer or to AIDS and who wanted to do something extraordinary. This is an example of one of the TV commercials we used to run for the three days. Dear Mom, having a great time. I was kind of scared, 60 miles in three days, sleeping in a tent. But I feel like I'm being carried along on this great big wave of kindness. And they told us this morning no group this small ever raised this much money to fight breast cancer. thousand of us and we raised seven million dollars wish you were here mom I really wish you were here So producing these events for 10 years and listening to the criticism that we received gave me a unique perspective on the way the public thinks about charity and thinks about nonprofit business practice. So we weren't only criticized for being for profit, but we were criticized for advertising in the New York Times and for having you know, flashy catalogs, so to speak, that it advertised the events, and for cross-marketing AIDS events on breast cancer events. All kinds of things that the for-profit sector does without batting an eyelash at, but people were uncomfortable with it in, in a nonprofit setting. And so I, I began to see this dysfunctional hole, and I wanted to write about it, and so that's what the book is about. The book is about transforming the way the donating public thinks about charity. It's about changing virtually everything we've been taught. Because I think that what we've been taught is upside down. I think it's backwards. And on the matter of ethics, 
I literally think that the paradigm we currently have for change is unethical. 